Hey and welcome to the fourth episode of this format. I know I just recently dropped episode 3 and I'm not a fan of uploading episodes for the same format back to back, but the next upload will be really elaborate and I didn't want to go another week without an upload. I also said that I'd drop videos on my second channel, which didn't happen yet. I really should stop making promises. Honestly, I have no idea when I'll drop videos on there since I have no time whatsoever this month, but eventually I'll start uploading there. And once I upload on there, I'll be very consistent. Also, I'm pretty close to 1k followers on Twitter. I know the platform is pretty garbage, but it's pretty useful to contact YouTube whenever I have a problem, so I'd appreciate some of you following me. Other than that, as always, if you like this video, don't forget to sub to the channel. And before we dive into the first few topics, you know that I'm a gaming YouTuber now, obviously, so let's quickly hear a word from today's sponsor, Gin Rummy Stars. Gin Rummy Stars is a free-to-play card game that you can play anywhere at any time. I honestly had quite a bit of fun so far. Besides the unique concept of the game, the interactions with the opponent can be quite fun as well. The game is totally free to play for both Android and iOS, so download the app from the link in the description. The game is really straightforward and easy to understand. Besides the very short tutorial in the beginning, you immediately jump straight into the action, which I honestly prefer a lot. If I download a game, I want to immediately get into the fun part. Overall, you always play against a live opponent, which makes the game really competitive at times. Playing Jin is really useful to improve on your strategy skills and abilities as well. Like I said, the download link is down below, and if you use it, you'll get 1000 free coins. The game has also Joker's Gen variant, which is a really risky game mode. After a bit of struggles, I got a win here. I think with the Joker card, the game becomes more exciting since you could win or lose at any moment. It definitely gives you and the opponent more flexibility. You also can customize your own avatar. I went with a more undercover look, but you can really choose between a bunch of things. Honestly, I prefer games like these compared to other mobile games, since it is really fast paced and regardless of where you are or what you do, you can always pick it up and play a couple of rounds. So download the game from the link in the description and receive exclusive 1000 free coins to win extra rewards. By downloading the game, you're also supporting the channel completely for free. You'll also get bonuses for just playing the game daily. Also I have one more for you. Add a screenshot of the highest win gap to the video comments and the winner will win an extra 1000 free coins. My in-game name is Eudoxia, and I plan on playing a bit in an hour when this video goes live. I'll catch you in game. Now this one's really crazy. It's a really short post, but definitely seems real. It reads, In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His passing was a really hard thing for me to deal with, as he had passed away in March of 2011 and was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, mourning and crying, when my body went into full dangerous close by mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery and forced myself to get to my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting close to me. By the time I made it to my truck he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and started to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he. And so I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later. I'm at work bored and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop. Israel Keys, most known for taking the life of an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury the kids in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas for a wedding in a city not too far from where I live and had disappeared for a bit and no one in his family knew where he was. He was arrested in that city and brought to the prison one city over from me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago, I found a book about him that provided a lot of the details I've given here. He had been taking people's lives for years, and no one knows what the actual death toll is. At the end of the book about him, he described some of his favorite places to abduct people, public parks and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kid buried in those woods. You were fast, Israel. 
but I was faster and I'm glad we didn't officially meet. After this initial pose, he made a few more edits for clarification. Edit. The app I was on doesn't seem to exist anymore. It was called Paranormal News, but the one in the Google Play Store isn't the same. For clarification, I wasn't super far away from my truck, maybe 30 feet, so I didn't have to go far, but I damn near levitated there. OP also added in a reply that he or she wasn't the only one to get away from him, according to Israel's own book. One more thing is interesting. In the replies, OP adds that the FBI is still looking for his kids and places that he frequented and that they intend to share some more information with the police. Another person under this reply says that they also had an encounter with Israel. Just last year, the FBI released new details in part of a campaign to get more tips about his whereabouts travel. Here's a link to it. Ever since he was originally arrested, I have recognized him, or at least I'm pretty sure it was him. Unlike your encounter, mine was not scary. My next door neighbors were having a party. He was driving through the area, heard people partying, and randomly decided to pull over and come inside. Normally, this wouldn't have faced us at all cause we were college students living it up. But he creeped people out, especially the girls. Even though this party was in 2002 and he wasn't arrested until 10 years later, I'm pretty positive it was him. So this one is really something else. It comes from a user named Concerned Dad 1965 He made a post on Ask Reddit. It reads, I think my teenage son may have sodomized our dog. I'm not sure what to do. Help me, Reddit. Okay, for obvious reasons, this is a throwaway account. So I'm not even sure how to start here. The last couple of weeks, my dog, 7-year-old Lab, has been acting noticeably different. I guess I could describe it as distant and even depressed. He's normally an extremely outgoing and happy dog, very playful and energetic, etc. He started acting very withdrawn and nervous around people, even his own family. At first, I kind of brushed it off as feeling under the weather, but after about a week and a half, I decided maybe he needed to see a vet. I got him in yesterday and after an examination, the vet told me that he believes the dog has been sodomized. It had slight damage in a way that was consistent with that sort of thing. He said he can't really imagine that his injuries could have come about any other way. So already now I'm pretty upset and sort of freaking out. Who would do this sort of thing to a dog? I thought about all of the people that had access to the dog and my backyard. Gardeners crossed my mind, my neighbors, etc. The only people that live in the house are my wife, myself, and our teenage son. I came home and thought about it for a while. I had this really ugly sinking feeling in my stomach about the possibility that it could have been my son. I decided to look around his room. I didn't really know what I was expecting to find, and I didn't really find anything in there that screamed guilty, until I decided to check his browser history. I found he had been on a bestiality forum recently, and a site with pictures of that sort of thing. I felt like I was going to throw up. Now I know that this isn't definitive proof of anything, but it sure doesn't look good. The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced my son had intercourse with our dog. Ugh. I haven't told my wife yet or done anything about it. I haven't left him alone with the dog since. I'm totally confused and upset and don't really know how to proceed with this. Reddit, please, please help. I know this is a very, very crazy story, and the father even made numerous edits after this. Before I comment on this, let's have a look at the following. Edit. Thank you all for your advice to those of you who are serious. I understand this seems like a joke to some of you, but it's not to me. So for those of you who gave real advice, thank you. I think I'm going to take your advice and confront him about it privately, without involving my wife. It is not going to be an easy conversation, but it has to happen. My only worry is the possibility that he isn't guilty of this and somebody else did it. I guess then, we still need to talk about what I found on his computer anyways. Thank you for being there for me, Reddit. Edit 2. Okay, my son just got home. I'm going to have the conversation with him when I can get a moment alone, and I will come back and let you guys know what happened. Edit 3. Okay, just spoke to my son. Before I get into our talk, let me quickly say thank you all again for your incredible advice and support. There were a lot of really, really helpful suggestions in here, and I took some of your advice. Anyways, our family had dinner and did our usual nighttime stuff. My wife and I watched TV. Son was in his room after dinner like all teenagers are, and Doc obviously was with me. I waited for my wife to go to bed, which felt like forever because I was so nervous. 
but she finally did about an hour ago, and I went into my son's room to have the talk. I basically said, listen, I noticed the dog has been acting weird, I took him to the vet, I found out someone had intercourse with him, any ideas what might have happened. I looked at my son and he seemed ever so slightly nervous, but pretended to know nothing about it. I expected this, so I brought up the sites I found on his computer. Naturally, this made him pretty upset, and he got really indignant at the thought that I snooped around his computer. Fair enough, I get it. But I got him back to the point, and tried to be as understanding and fatherly as I could, and just told him that whatever happened, I'm not going to judge him and he's not going to be punished, I just need to know the truth. After about 10 to 12 minutes of this, he finally breaks down and admits that he put the handle of a hairbrush as well as fingers into the dog a few times during a day last week. He said he wasn't trying to hurt him and he stopped when the dog at one point freaked out. He said he didn't think he hurt it that bad and he was too embarrassed to tell us or do anything about it. I believed him in this, but he also didn't give a very satisfactory answer as to why exactly he would do this in the first place. I have to admit, either way, I was glad on some level to hear that he wasn't intimate with the dog. So basically, we agreed that I wouldn't tell his mom, but that we would find a reason to tell her that he needs to see a therapist for a bit. I know I told him I wouldn't tell his mother, but the more I think about all of this, the more I think I may eventually have to go back on that promise. As for now, the dog is staying with the family, and obviously I made him swear up and down that he won't touch the dog like that again, under threat of severe consequences. It's too early to tell if he feels remorse, or is just humiliated. It's hard to say. It was very uncomfortable for both of us, but especially my son. I'm sure we can all imagine. Thank you all again so incredibly much for your support, advice, understanding, and love for both the dog and my son. I have to admit, some of you even made me laugh at a few things I didn't want to. Thanks again, Reddit. Edit 4. Due to the outpouring of concern and help from you guys, I will update in a week or so and let you know what's happened. Today I located a therapist that specializes in teenagers. I made a preliminary appointment for my son to go in and talk to her. I disclosed to her some of the issues without getting into too much detail. For now, my son doesn't know this, but it will be helpful for her to have some idea of what we are dealing with. My dog is still not in the best of spirits, but seems to be making progress. I went for a walk with him today, and he was more playful than he has been the past week. I've been trying to be extra good to him as well, and the laugh seems to be helping slowly to bring the happiness back into his eyes. Can't say I'm still not a little peeved about what happened, but I feel like to show my son that I'm too upset might be damaging right now. I think we just need to find out why he thought this was okay. As for the brush handle, some of you bring up a good point. I should ask him to throw whichever brush that is away. For some reason, that didn't even cross my mind. Anyways, I'll give you all an update on the situation in a week. Thanks again. Well, an update never followed. Also, a few redditors in the replies point out a few things about the story. One user says, I'm really sorry, but I suspect the hairbrush explanation is an excuse to cover up what really happened. I hope it isn't. Others also added that the dad should give the hairbrush a sniff test to confirm that it matches up with his son's story. A different Reddit user has a different theory. It says, Putting your hairbrush fingers up there was probably just a test to see what the dog would put up with before risking anything... uh... delicate. Also, the father mentioned a website that the son visited, which to me pretty much confirms that the son was lying, or at least not saying the full truth. Maybe it was a huge coincidence that he randomly stumbled upon that site, and then the incident with the dog happened. No idea, and we'll probably never know. So this one was recommended to me a bunch of times in the past, but I didn't want to dedicate an entire video to this. Ever since starting this format, I always wanted to include this user in one of the episodes. The user Lady Iris made posts around 7 years ago on multiple accounts, which are really deranged. In one of her first posts, she asked as to what the best ways are to cause extreme harm to someone without instantly causing their death. This doesn't seem to be such an odd question if we disregard her entire post history. Actually, she made numerous posts across multiple accounts, fantasizing about tormenting people. She also gets a weird enjoyment out of the suffering of others. Most posts were made on the morbid questions and asked Reddit subreddit. In the following, I'll talk about the most interesting ones. Her first few posts are generally not even that bad. 
You could classify them as morbid curiosity. However, the deeper we look into this, the more it becomes obvious that Lady Iris has a very strong urge and desire to harm others. Some posts are extremely graphic, so I won't include them in this video. This one comes from Ask Reddit and reads, Why in your own words is taking an innocent person's life morally wrong? You have the obvious responses such as, you shouldn't do it, you have no right of deciding that, etc, etc. Her replies to these comments are that humans make this decision for animals all the time and that she doesn't really understand the difference between humans and animals. She also says that this is purely a social phenomenon and suggests that this is not immoral. Overall, this is pretty much the start of her rationalizing her tendencies and urges. In a different thread, she asks people what they do if they get the urge to take someone else's life. Interesting is her elaboration in the replies. The thoughts themselves aren't uncomfortable though. It's a sadistic thing for me. I enjoy the thoughts and they bring me great pleasure, but it's frustrating not being able to indulge in them. If I knew I could get away with it, I'd take the risk. But I'm too careless of a person and I know I would be caught. I have a good life and don't want to spend it in jail. In a different reply she states as to how long she has been dealing with her urges. I'm about to turn 26 this October. I've had these urges since I was a child and they've only gotten stronger with age. I've talked to therapists before and nothing they have done has been of much help. The only thing I could do is take medication and that just numbs me and makes me lose pleasure in everything. She also states that she hasn't been in therapy for over 10 years now. Anyway, she clarifies in other posts that her urges are never meant to be intimate. I've mentioned it many times on both accounts. It is most definitely a turn on and a huge thrill for me to see people suffering or dying. However, it's not intimate in the sense that I don't have any attraction to the victims and would never wish to engage or be intimate with someone I was hurting or watching get hurt. In fact, the act is of no interest to me at all and I don't get excited by SNM and other consensual role-playing games. But the feeling of ultimate power over someone, the sheer cruelty of harming them against their will and the deliberate wrongness of it makes me feel orgasmic. That's why I'm so obsessed with it. That's why I watch videos of people dying and make posts about it. Just seeing what I want to do written out gets me excited. Honestly, the replies only get more graphic from here on onward, so I'll stop here. I know this could just be an edgelord or a troll trying to get attention, so take the post history of this user with a grain of salt. So this final post comes from a user called Alexander Rob. It's basically a long story. It was shared a few months ago and reads, Strange happenings in the mountains of Washington state. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least, as a crow flies from a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7k feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up, make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up the steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots, not the excited high-pitched barks, but rather unsure, concerned barks. Now the day before, I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problematic bear in the area that was harassing a group of campers a few days ago. And I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before. So I was rightfully concerned that this may be something more. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill, while I took some time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see, hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I start hiking up the steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep, I had to use the trees to balance and lean against, so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another 5-6 to six steps to the next tree I could lean against. Anyway, I'm making it up this hill, rich, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. And then, I get about 100 feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep, low growl, to a savage, slobber type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in the matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. And I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, 
I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 feet cliff onto the boulders below, like 100s of 5 to 20 feet boulders. So I'm feeling pretty screwed now. Then I hear my other little dog barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent, so she couldn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kinda snapped out of it. And I took another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order and call my dog back to me. He comes and sits against my feet, as my back is against a tree. So I'm kinda pinned, stuck there for the moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. While I reach up to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious rush going on right now, even my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection of the eyes of whatever is up there. Peering, peering, nothing. But I had just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away. Or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there. So I'm kinda just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there. Because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait all night. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet. And I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does it, I finally see movement. Something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover. So I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch. And what I see made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me. Wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy stuff with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually almost like a makeshift gill suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something. But I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So I stare, for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total dark, or I could be seriously hurt, risk dying trying to get back down. And so carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in the direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him. And eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark, or just barking back at my dog. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling, with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought okay. Maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out. But I was positive I had zipped it to the very top of the tent door. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40. I fired a single shot in the air as the sun was setting, climbed into my tent without eating and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks, it was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp, about 4 miles from my vehicle. But thankfully, there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning. So I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we are both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all of that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on. Other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a deceased man found from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago. And a woman, which had her life taken away last year. I mean, I had to correct a lot of sentences here, but this reads like a genuine story. If the guy he saw is connected with the passing of those two people he mentioned at the end of his story is unclear, but it definitely was an interesting read. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to try out Jinrami Stars for free. Link is down below. Before ending this off, 
I want to quickly thank the patrons in the Elite and Legend tier, which consist of 44, Ashton Booth YouTube, C, Christopher J. McCulloch, Courtney O'Colt, Krebs Ugen, Dark Sparrow, Dave Birkins, DEZ03, DJ Chest R, Electrocat, Eli Bueno, Ian Wenkmer, Findecano Astaldo, Foster Bradley, James Baker, Just Jackie, Connected Tobias, Dora Hansen, Lord of the Lizards, Madeline Tanner, Morgok C, Matt Weldon, Nikius Beardius, NX Sequel, Rick, Santino Sierra, Shawnee, Wayne Keir, William Taylor, Amy Stringfellow, Alan Eberl, Elena Hatchu's Mom, Andrew 906, Bodie, Brian Cave, Brian Aschaff, Casey Lockie, Christopher, Dark Nalol, Dennis Greasefire, Digital Capybara, Erica Romero, Jeb, Cass Silver, Lunaros, Maria Schoenberger, Malcolm Mart, MG, Natalie Weston, Nick Castle, Noodles, Riley Bear, Radislav Koshevi, Witch Corps, and XXFOHV. Thanks to every other patron and the supporter here, I really appreciate that. I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.